Hey everybody, welcome back to the Stonks on Rails series where I'm continuing to write the stock journaling application to assist with my trading. In this episode, I don't have as much of a defined plan when I'm starting out, but I do want to finish working on this modal form from where we left off last time. I'm going to add the edit functionality and along with adding metadata, I wanted to take a screen capture of my screen so that I could go back and reference the stock chart from at the time that I made the note. And along with that, I also want to include some additional menu options to help me filter through all of these notes. So I want to be able to sort by ticker and the tags that I have for the particular setup that I'm looking at. So I think in this video, I'm probably just going to get to one of those, but I'm just kind of making this as I go along and let's get started. So the first thing that I'm going to do is get rid of this temporary code that I put in place, which makes use of validation that easily fails so that I could just test out the form and see that Hotwire Rails loads the error message properly. At this time, I don't really need any validation for the stomp note. I just wanted to demonstrate this feature in Hotwire in the last video. So I can remove that code right now. Doing some adjustments to that validation. I have a little problem here with Turbo. So when submitting, it's not returning the correct form, or better yet, I should say that the form is not refreshing properly. It's not adding it to the background like it should. It's just crashing what's going on. All right, so I did a little bit of a, a cut here in the video, but I was able to fix that issue with the 500 error that was popping up when it was doing the result of the create operation of the new stock note. And what was happening was uh, in the template, this call to form with was trying to set up the route to go edit a stock note. And that's because when I was doing my demo in the previous video, the, the stock note that was getting reviewed by the controller wasn't getting put into the database. So it wasn't getting persisted. And therefore the route for create versus editing or updating a stock note didn't change. It, it was just a, a dummy value that was being placed there. But now that this is actually persisted in the database, form with is being smart and it's trying to look for a new path to send the stonk note when it's refreshing the form. So let me show you in the code what was going on. So what I had here was it would try to create the note. In the previous version, I just had it create like a new note. This here never got saved into the database. What it would do is it would just have like an invalid or, or possibly invalid note we were testing just the validation to see if the validation error message would show up but having stock note dot new which is just an object record containing a stock note information versus one that's saved into the actual database presents differently when you send that in the form with because you're looking at the create a new one route versus the update an existing one route so here going to the rails docs this post is what happens when you're trying to create something and basically i just had it rigged up for create when i made the edit to this code here it's looking for an edit and it's looking for a patch or a put route and i didn't have those and the way i fixed that was i just went into the routes and I added the create and update routes and now that got rid of the 500 error. By the way, I know that this is all very hard to follow along what I'm saying here. So I recommend going to the GitHub link that I have in the video description and taking a look at the source code yourself. For every video that I publish, I put a tag for it, especially for that particular commit related to this video. And then you could check out the tags and compare them to the changes that I made versus other videos. Okay, so a new problem that I have that I didn't really fix up in the previous video is this new note button. It doesn't refresh this with a brand new form when it ends. What's going on is you create the uh, stock note and then what it does is it refreshes this with kind of like an edit uh, version of this. And we don't want that. We want this to reset so that when you hit the new note button, you get a fresh note. So the way I'm going to have it reload the form is just instead of here showing the result 
which was a successfully created stock note. I'll just have it do a stock note dot new, which would be a completely fresh one. And let's see if that works. And as you can see, there it goes. It seems to be working. And we know that the records are getting persisted in the database because there's an ID number that shows up along with each record. The next item on my roadmap that I'm going to complete is taking the screen capture and I'm going to use the methodology that I cited in my previous video using the NERSOFT screen capture utility executed by the command line. And since this is a special piece of business logic, I'm also going to deploy the interactor design pattern so that the screen capture functionality is isolated to its own class that will be invoked probably by the controller. Now you'll probably recognize this pattern right here with the three dots for the pass-through arguments operator, which I covered in my previous video about breaking changes in Ruby 3.0. I'm doing this to set up a base class for my interactors. Sometimes people call these service objects. I like to use the term interactor, and I don't need a fancy gem for that or anything. All I need is just plain old Ruby with the call method to activate it. So after working at this for just a little bit, I'm finding that I actually want to have two levels of interactor here. I kind of nest them. So this one that I'm building here should just be taking the screenshot, just performing that task of running the command, where I want to have one that's one level above, which is going to create it along with the metadata for that particular note. So I'll have the one that creates the metadata as sort of the top level and it'll defer to this. And the reason I like to break them up into a hierarchical level like this is because it makes it easier to test and debug. When you're working with a much larger system, uh, you're gonna to wanna to have a lot of unit tests. In this case, I'm skipping unit tests just because it's my own personal hobby application. And uh, I just don't think testing at this point would be worth the time. The benefits outweigh the, the cost of my time. But if this were more of a commercial application, I would definitely be unit testing and breaking this down, breaking down all of the interactors at a level where I could mock the inputs and outputs of them and know exactly what should be going in or what could possibly go in and what sort of output it should return under all of those cases. To accomplish all the testing that I really need for this application, I could just manually test them using the Rails console like this. But in a production setting, I'd probably be using RSpec to run the exact same thing and automate the checking of the inputs and outputs. Well, it can't find the screenshots module that I just created. What if this has to do with Spring? In case you're unfamiliar with the Spring application loader, it's a background utility used by Rails to keep parts of the program running in memory so that if for whatever reason you need to restart the Rails server or the Rails console, the load time is going to be faster because parts of the program are already loaded and cached in memory. Although it improves development performance, sometimes Spring causes weird quirks like this by causing parts of your program to not refresh correctly. And this shouldn't be a problem in production, but it's something that occasionally pops up when you're developing. So I'm going to restart the spring process by running the command bin spring stop and then just reload the Rails console. Oh, it was spring. <laughs> so another thing that I want to note is that this convert utility here is a part of image magic, which is another dependency that I'll be using to perform the screenshot thumbnail creation. As you can see here, when I try running the take screenshot interactor, that convert utility is raising an error because it can't find the input image for which it's going to build the thumbnail. I edited out some of the investigative work I did in figuring out this problem, but after running some binding.pry breakpoints to the console, I started to suspect that this is a race condition where image magic is trying to build a thumbnail before the input screenshot is written to a file. The way that I fixed this was by including a small delay using the sleep command between the screenshot command and the thumbnail generation command. And this seemed to solve the problem. Now we could see that the screen capture files are generating in the file system and we could preview them. This is why I like the interactor design pattern because I could easily unit test something like this. Now I've got to just plug this into the rest of the application 
But first, I'm going to write that interactor class a level above this one. And this interactor will call the take local screenshot interactor. And on top of it, it will add some metadata that's also going to make it so that we can more easily mass assign those attributes to an active record model. Note this little argument error that I'm putting in the class here. This is my way of doing a little custom type checking on the input, since Ruby doesn't have its own built-in type checking. It's also a good documentation method because it makes it easy to know what type of data this interactor expects to take as an input. I think type checking becomes more of an issue when your Ruby project reaches a certain scale and complexity in its data models, because sometimes you have to do complex operations on a number of attributes on the data object, and it's useful to have an easy way of documenting exactly what that input data model should look like. Also, in setting up my program this way, I'm sort of making use of the solid concept of dependency inversion. Rather than putting this functionality on the stonk note model itself, I'm passing a stonk note into this interactor and it's going to work on the stonk note model. And this keeps the active record model from doing too much business logic processing. We can then have a very simple active record model that just has functionality for accessing and modifying things inside the database while the business logic is mainly handled by interactor classes like this one. So now with our backend code in place, let's give this a try from the front end. And we get a 500 internal server error on the request. Something concerning to me about this is that a typical end user would have no way of knowing that this type of problem occurred. The web page basically just went dead without any warning or message. The only way I know about it is by inspecting the web requests from the browser debugging tools. This could be one of the weaknesses of Kerbal right now if they don't have a better way of handling this. You would think that 500 server errors are a common thing to worry about and that Kerbal would have a way of dealing with that case to gracefully fail. But even on the Hotwire support message board, there doesn't seem to be yet a best practice for handling this situation and that's a little bit disappointing to me. So I'm going to have to figure out a workaround for this later. So now, what seems to be causing this error? It looks to be the Rails asset pipeline. After some further digging around in the Rails console and looking at the data, I found a discrepancy in the way that the image references were being built and it had to do with whether or not the path started with a forward backslash. These URLs get passed into the image tag view helper method, which reacts differently depending on whether an input URL provided to it contains a backslash or not. I had to go into the interactor class again and corrected a line of code to make sure that the slashes at the beginning were getting included. And there we go. Our screenshots are loading through the correct route now. So I think that's about it for this video. If you thought this was a very interesting tutorial and you learned something, go ahead and hit the like button. And also subscribe to my channel as I'll be doing a lot more of this Stonks on Rails series where you could probably learn some interesting advanced Ruby tricks. And by the way, if, if you have any better ideas on how I could do some of this, don't forget to check out the GitHub code on the GitHub and leave me a comment on what you think about this style of coding. So I'll see you in the next video.